I know the last time we were chatting a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll kind of kick it off. Uh, and they have a really interesting childhood uh, and upbringing. So um, if you can expand upon that for our listeners as to where you came from, um, you know, from from the very beginning and, and what that that upbringing was like. Absolutely, Mark. Pleasure to be here and uh, and happy to to have a conversation. It's it's fascinating to look back um, on an interesting career to sort of the early beginnings and say I am truly uh, a child, literally of the '60s. My parents were successful folks based in the East Coast, New York City, and uh, my dad took a journey down the personal awareness path. Um, in the mid '60s, became an author and got very involved with a path towards trying to discover uh, enlightenment. And as a result, he wrote a book. Um, and during research for the book, we were living as a family, my two brothers and I, in Palo Alto in the mid '60s. And uh, he became aware of a part of the country called Big Sur, a coast of California, south of Monterey. And Esalen Institute in particular was a uh, sort of a center for uh, the personal awareness movement where a lot of the early stage um, evangelists came from. And uh, we were living in a house in Palo Alto. My mom walked in and said, hey, guys, uh, pack up all your stuff. You get a suitcase. My brothers and I packed up all our stuff into basically a suitcase. We left a comfortable four bedroom house, drove. 60 miles down the coast and pulled over on the side of the highway and there was a camper shell detached from a pickup truck jacked up in a turnabout on the side of the highway in Big Sur and that was our house. No electricity, no running water, a uh, water spigot on the turnabout, you know, six, eight feet away from the back door of the camper and that's where we moved to. Wow. What, what was your, what was your first reaction, you know, coming from what you came from and, and you know, this being your new home, your new environment, do you remember how that felt or, you know, what you were thinking? Oh, absolutely. It was almost as clear as if it was yesterday. I got out of the car and I looked at my mom and I said, are you freaking kidding me? And I might've used another word besides freaking. Um, but it, you know, you're a kid, you're, you're eight, nine years old, you adapt quickly and it, it instantly became this new, wonderful adventure. We were, uh, about three quarters of a mile north of Esalen, which was, you know, full of people and full of interesting stuff. And my mom was working there. So walking back and forth was uh, was easy. And it was a time in America where people were nicer and kinder to each other. So you never really felt um, scared or at risk. And uh, we moved from the camper shell to a trailer, single wide trailer. Um mm -hmm. My brother and I turned the hallway closet into bunk beds, which was really cool, except it was about 16 inches wide, and huh. you had to climb through the cabinet doors to get to your bed. Oh, wow. So a little, little fort. Basically a little fort. Then yeah. uh, we moved up in the world and moved into a double-wide trailer. Um, still no electricity, but indoor plumbing and running water, which was cool. And we moved up and down the coast, um, sometimes with my dad because they were separated at that point, sometimes with my mom, sometimes the whole family together when my parents would reconcile. And we went from a camper to a trailer to a Quonset hut to a nice house and uh, the whole time went to a one-room school. So if all the kids showed up, kindergarten through eighth grade, there were 26 kids in a good year. And uh, we'd start the generator in the morning, and your bus ride was somewhere between 28 miles, the farthest, or sometimes we lived right above the school and would walk a mile downhill to go to school. Wow. So, yeah, that's a, you know, definitely a, uh, obviously a lot of change, right? You were experiencing that pretty early on. So, yeah, I guess... You know, as you went through school, um, how, how was how was school for you? Did, did you, you know, with, with all that change, it's probably tough to kind of settle in. So how how was the the experience through school for you? Um, it was fascinating. Um, great friendships, um, hitchhike up and down the coast, to visit your friends or catch a ride with a pal. Most of the time you knew who was going up and down the coast. Um, if you didn't come home that night, your mom didn't get worried because she figured you were at Cam or Judd's or 
or PB's house or one of your pals. Um, mm-hmm. What what it fostered for me was, um, I would say, a dramatic imagination in the sense that I had no forms of visual media other than books and stories. I didn't have a radio. Uh, I didn't have TV. We had a turntable that was battery powered. So I listened to a lot of music and the early stages, first couple of years, our teacher would read a chapter or two out of the Hobbit and then the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And to us, our backyard, quite literally the Los Padres National Forest was like the Shire and Middle Earth. So it was great to hear those stories and then run out of school up into the hills and the woods and build forts and slay dragons and whatnot. So um, what it taught me from an early age, with the wisdom of looking backwards, is uh, and a tremendous imagination and a significant degree of independence. Yeah, and that, you know, obviously looking at, uh, you know, what, what you've done to date, um, and going back, obviously that probably played a pretty big role in, um, in your decisions, your business ventures, all that stuff, uh, you know, now. It was a very interesting childhood that, like all of our childhoods, had a dramatic impact on where I went in my life and what I am or what I have become as of, as of today. Growing up in, it, to that point in my life in Big Sur had delivered this sense of independence and a very, um, strong knit closeness with my brothers because we were sort of an entity and my parents continued their journey, took us to South America to a town called Arica, Chile on the Peruvian border, which at that point was the driest, most populated place on the planet earth. Um, the Atacama desert was surrounding us and it quite literally never rained earthquakes for sure, but it never rained. Uh, we moved from Chile to New York, Uh, a couple of different places in New York. We moved then to San Francisco, a couple of places in San Francisco, and then to Atlanta. And along the way, um, my parents were finally separated for the last time and divorced. um, And we shed family members at each point. So by the time we got to Atlanta, um, my younger sister had joined, and my only sister had joined the family. She was born at home, in essence, at a friend's house when we were living in South America. My younger brother was in New York with my dad and my older brother. We uh, we left by his choice in San Francisco. So Mm. I'm now 14, 15 years old, living in Atlanta, Georgia, in the early to mid 70s. Um, It was a fascinating time. Yeah. What was what was it like in, in Atlanta at that time? You know, Looking back, you know, I see, uh, you know, what the 70s were like, but, you know, more in particular, what was Atlanta like? What was that scene? What was the culture like at that time? And and how did that influence you? Um, I, I love Atlanta to death. It's got a very near and dear place in my heart because it was a huge transformational moment for me. But in 1973, 1974, Atlanta was the South. And I moved down there from beaten at Kippy Haven with longer than shoulder length hair and a Levi jacket. And uh, I went to public school for three days and discovered that if you misbehaved, corporal punishment was still legal. So they could hit you um, with a paddle. And uh, that was the end of my going to public school in Atlanta. Um, And... uh, It was, I won't say it was parochial, but let's just say it was a very simple, rigid, unenlightened lifestyle at that point. How long were you down there in Atlanta for until uh, until you made your next move? I lived in Atlanta for six years, four years of high school, two years of college. So um, adapted quickly um, because my mom and I took a little time and found a private school in Atlanta that was uh, the most progressive private school. And uh, it was October, early October, and the school was called the Galloway School, named after the headmaster, the head of school, Elliot Galloway. And I walked over to his office as part of the interview process, um, and I sat down with Mr. Galloway, and he said, uh, you know, the school year's already started. And I said, I know. And he said, our classes are full. And I said, I know. And he <laughs> said, so why do you want to come here? Why do you want to do this 
at this point in your life because clearly you've had experiences that no one else at the school has had. And I, I paused and um, I told him the truth. I said, Mr. Galloway, I have moved literally around the world. I have had a lot of different experiences. And at this point in my life, I just want to be normal. I just want to live a normal life. And I was 15 years old. Wow. And, and uh, a trem- that man had a tremendous impact on my life, not just for the next six years, but uh, almost weekly since then. And he got up from his desk, shook my hand, walked out to his assistant and the head of admissions and said, let's find a place for Adam to start on Monday. Wow. So what, what happened after that? So um, the dramatic moment where a fiercely independent, incredibly insecure young man started ninth grade. And I was someone who had been raised by wolves. Um, I had grown up with the tremendous benefit of significant adult conversation and minimal peer conversation. So to say that I felt like a fish out of water is a horrible understatement. And uh, it took me six or seven months to figure out what rules applied to social situations for young teenagers. Um, And young teenagers are vicious animals. Um, And I worked really hard to find a way to fit in. So on a social perspective, um, it was terrifying. It was frightening. Um, it was rewarding. I have the benefit of a, a, a young man who befriended me early on in the journey and to this day is my best friend in life. Still lives in Atlanta and, and we've been pals for, let's just say, more than a couple of years. Academically, the journey was tougher. So formal schooling through second grade, Big Sur for four years, South America, I didn't go to school, New York, I didn't go to school. San Francisco, I went to sort of a free school where we didn't do much of anything. So with regards to reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, the only class I was any good at was Spanish because I'd been speaking Spanish for a year and a half in in Chile. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had a lot to catch up with, and that became a a clear focus for me. Wow, that's that's pretty incredible. Outside of school, did you have anything? You know, I I know a lot of marketing uh, executives like yourself, they've had, you know, kind of that entrepreneurial spirit early on. Did you have anything like that? Any little side hustles? Um, yeah, I love the term side hustles. Back then it was called work. <laughs> um, so I live with my mom my freshman year, halfway through my sophomore year, right after I turned 16 in December. Um, my mom announced that her and my sister were moving to LA and that I was going to move with them. And I told her, no, that was not going to happen. I was comfortable and happy in Atlanta. So she moved to LA and my dad was in New York and I moved in with my best friend who he and his family adopted me for the balance of my sophomore year. Um, that summer, um, I got a job. And uh, I created a lawn care service and spent the summer with my pal Kenny mowing lawns in Atlanta humidity, which is something everyone should do for one summer only. Um, And then I learned the art of negotiation with my dad, who um, made it very clear to me that um, the alimony spousal support payments he was going to make to my mom, I was not eligible for. Um, And the conversation went sort of like this. Hey, dad, um, you know, you are going to have to pay mom 200 bucks a month if uh, 250 bucks a month if I'm, uh, if I'm going to live with her in L.A. and I'm going to stay in Atlanta. So how about you write me the check for 250 bucks to which he said no. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you've lost all your leverage in this conversation because I know you don't want to live in L.A. And so I don't have to pay 250 dollars. I don't have to pay any of it. To which we, through some fierce negotiation, agreed on $200 a month. So 1975, um, I got $200 a month from my dad. My rent in a garage apartment was 125 bucks, And everything else I needed to live on, other than tuition, 
which is paid for by my grandparents, thankfully, um, I had to earn. So I was a lawn care specialist. Um, I was a bar back. I was a surveyor's apprentice. I was the guy that held the stick that the guy looks through through the telescope. I did that on newly paved parking lots in Atlanta, Georgia, also in the summertime, something I can tell you with a passion I no longer want to do with my life. Um, so yeah, my, my side hustles were um, both because I wanted to find different things that paid well, and two, my grandfather told me early on, which were guiding light words, guiding words of wisdom in my career, it's better to know a little about a lot of things because that will help you determine what you're good at and what you like. So I tried lots of things because I wanted to and because I had to pay the rent. Right. That makes sense. Now I was curious, the, the, uh, the lawn care service, what made you think this is, this is the one that I'm going to, you know, kind of build out. I, uh, <clears throat> Need and opportunity are the two drivers for um, work. Um, I need money, and I'm inspired to do something that initially I thought was easy. How hard is it going to be to push a mower around? Right. And um, I would spend weekends mowing Kenny's parents' lawn because I felt obligated to contribute as a member of the household. And then a neighbor came by and said, hey, would you guys like to mow my lawn? And we went and mowed his lawn, and he handed us an insurmountably large amount of money back then, probably 10 bucks. And I'm like, can I come back and do this every week? And he's like, yeah, that would be great. And then the next neighbor, and then the next neighbor, and then you walk around the neighborhood, and you begin to ask people, hey, how much are you charging to get your lawn mowed? Well, I'll do it for X amount less. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, I had – three groups of kids and we're mowing lawns and I'm taking a little vig off the top and everybody's happy. And, you know, when kids didn't show up for work, I mowed lawns from dawn to dusk to make sure that the work got done. But, and you know, your reputation precedes you and neighbors talk to each other. Right. Yeah. So something just as simple as that. I mean, myself, I overthink a lot of things, you know, kind of wait to, to see, is this the right venture to, to kind of dive into, but you know, if you have a need, you're doing it for somebody. I'm sure there's other people out there, um, even for anybody listening, that if they're doing something, there's probably other folks that would want the same done. So just go and, and kind of uh, put that out there, I guess, would be the, the advice there. A yes and, and no. I am, I am probably at the leading edge of um, follow my instinct, um, which not always right, but follow my instinct and – I've been a huge believer of just jumping into the deep end of the pool and I'll figure out how to swim. So um, I don't think I've ever been accused of overthinking anything. So, yeah, you just dive in first and uh, I'll figure, figure it out, out later. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, kind of leading into, um, you know, your experience in college. I know you went through and, and had some experiences there with you know, kind of pulling the plug, so to say, uh, with the uh, the TV, you know, studio and station that you worked with. So um, if you want to elaborate a little bit on that and, and what that was like. Yeah, I, uh, I learned early on, really, when I got to high school that that my go to war strength, my unique ability, which everybody has and identifying it is critical. But the unique ability that I had, um, which is a nice way of saying the part of my life I found easy that other people found hard. So if you're good at something and other people are not good at that, that should be your career path, at least for a period of time. And mine was seeing pictures. And I got into making movies with a Super 8 camera at an incredibly early age, freshman year of high school, and just fell in love with the whole process of using visual images to tell stories. That resulted in me applying to film school. I was fortunate enough to get into USC's film school and uh, came out to go to college. And uh, we were in a TV studio um, where I got addicted to the adrenaline of live TV. Um, film is a laborious process where you plan, you rehearse, you shoot. Film goes to the lab back then. You have to wait days for it to come back to see what it was you shot and if it worked. And, and film is right here right now. It's like playing sports. You get one time to take the last shot in the game. You get one time to make the free throw. 
you don't get to practice. And I had a teacher who was an incredible pain in the ass. He was a very, very intelligent man. And he would pick on kids that he felt were good. And uh, I was directing a live newscast and he was infamous for walking in and shooting your cameraman, so to speak, or your talent and telling you in the middle of things that they had a heart attack on set or whatever the scenario was to make your job harder. And week after week, he would pick on me and make my process harder and harder. So I had three cameras shooting an interview with two people and in a control room with a switcher and everything. And by the end of the show, he had unplugged all of my cameras, removed one of the talent and had left one microphone on. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved how I had to figure that out. And the more he unplugged and the more he challenged me, the hungrier and happier I got. And it just sounds wrong to say that that moment I just went, this is what I love doing. And it turned out I was good at it. Yeah. And that's not a, a comfortable thing. I don't think for most people to be put in that situation, a lot of people like to stay comfortable. So what would be your advice to people who have a hard time kind of breaking out of that? Is there, I mean, I guess, first off, is there a way for them to break out of that? Um, and then secondly, how, how do you kind of stay with that? Um, cause even myself, I mean, younger, uh, younger years, very introverted. Um, anybody that you ask today wouldn't say that I, I am introverted, but there's deep down, I, I think that's naturally who I am, but I've no, I've needed to make changes to, uh, to be more extroverted. So what are your thoughts on someone who wants to be a little bit more, you know, facing their their fears uh, i guess in a sense to uh to kind of you know build a little bit uh momentum you know for what they actually are, are targeting to do or, or striving to do yeah absolutely um you're not going to find a lot of people in your peer group or in your social group professionally or personally that felt more out of water than i did um i literally grew up going to a one room schoolhouse mm -hmm. and wind up at USC. Um, to say that I was terrified, insecure, and frightened in social situations and in environments in the classroom where everybody, it was rote memory for people. And to me, it was quite honestly like speaking Greek or, or, or um, um, calculus to me was a language to this day that I'll never understand but but that's okay so i would challenge myself to try and overcome my fears um i i learned at an early age probably my senior year in high school that you just have to go for it you just have to peel the band-aid off and you have to do it because it's become one of the mantras of my life um nobody died nobody went to jail it was a successful adventure Mm -hmm. And that's what I would do. So jumping into the deep end of the pool, um, just biting my upper lip and 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 doing it. And uh, sometimes it succeeded. Most of the time it failed miserably. But each time I did it, I felt stronger and I felt more secure that I could solve the problem. So it became kind of an adrenaline junkie scenario where I had to stress test things to get stronger. I found my secret power and the more I exercised it, the stronger I got. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, even right now, even from a, from a social media perspective, from, from my standpoint, I've been, you know, kind of, uh, testing, testing the waters, you know, every new platform that comes out. And, and recently I haven't done much. So, um, even trying to get back into that, I feel like I haven't really, uh, I haven't really dove back in all that much. And now, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of the live nature of social media and, you know, what kind of impact you think that might have, um, in the future, if you've dabbled in that at all, since 
you have that experience with the, uh, you know, loving that live TV. Now you actually have essentially a TV studio in your hands at all times. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Or, you know, brands using that to kind of, um, amplify what they're, what they're doing from even a, a marketing standpoint. So two, two slightly different tracks. Um, mm-hmm. The expectation of privacy related to personal social media is um, unique by person and by generation. So I grew up where things were more private and, and they weren't displayed and instantaneous gratification didn't exist other than the moment you asked the girl or the object of your affections out and they didn't shoot you. They actually agreed to go out with you other than that moment of instantaneous gratification. Um, I think that social media for an individual is a journey down an endorphin addiction. Um, You post something on Instagram and nothing feels better than 37 or 370 likes. You just are, you're, you're in a zone where you're high and then you want to feed your addiction. You want to feed the beast. Mm -hmm. Um, Maintaining an appropriate, perspective on your personal brand is critical. Um, you can be an adventure seeker. You can be emotionally a softy. You can be whatever you want, a beautiful photographer. Um, be true to your brand. Um, first and foremost, professionally, I think it's the most phenomenal and most phenomenal and the most dangerous marketing tool the world has seen. Um, it's incredibly successful when done right because you can affect perception in real time. Anheuser-Busch has 6,000 plus people that they listen to every day through social media that helps guide some of their marketing in-store and brand generation. I mean, to have a focus group of 6,000 people engaged with you minute by minute, hour by hour um, is a phenomenal opportunity. It's also dangerous because you lose sight of strategy and patience and learning, and you go from a proactive marketing perspective to a reactive marketing perspective. And I think too much of either is wrong. You have to find a balance that, in my opinion, is about 25 or 30 percent reactive and 70 plus percent proactive. You have to remember that you're driving the bus, and particularly if you're representing a brand that has investors or shareholders, you have a fiduciary responsibility and a moral obligation to them to be proactive and not always reactive. Right. Yeah, I guess it's tempting to be reactive to each situation, but if you lose sight of what your brand goals are and, and, and what you guys are actually striving for, it, it probably could take you pretty far off path. Absolutely. And you have to remember it's a channel. So right. if you're sitting in master control with all of the channels of communication for your brand, that's one. But all of the channels have to feed your strategy to attain your actual measurable goals so that you're moving the train down the tracks, the boat across the ocean. Pick your analogy. Right. Now that makes sense. And I know, you know, outside of social media, You've gotten into, I think you touched on a little bit about the uh, the documentary, which I feel like kind of catapulted you, you know, after college. So if you want to touch on that a little bit, I think that was an interesting story. Um, yes. It. So I got to USC. I started in film school. I migrated over to the cinema TV, the TV portion. And by the time I was a senior in in college, I was chosen as the one guy that year to direct a documentary. So the culmination of, of your hard work at college was you got to direct a documentary. And I was partnered with a woman um, who was the producer, and she had written a, a concept around uh, people who survived being shot. Documentary was called Gunshot. And we went out and interviewed five people who had been shot in different scenarios. One was shot as a gang initiation. One was a rape attempt in a classroom. One was a liquor store holdup, um, a variety of circumstance. And we went into it planning to conduct interviews. And what we found was 
that everybody had a unique story until the moment they saw the barrel of the gun. And from that moment forward, they all had exactly the same journey. So I also edited the documentary and it became really clear how we could tell this emotionally compelling story. So we did. We entered it into all of the award shows that you could back then, which were really um, the Emmy Awards for Students and uh, AFI, American Film Institute. And uh, we won both. So we won a, a student Emmy as the best documentary that year. And we won the AFI award for the best student documentary that year. Um, the documentary went on to air on PBS. It aired at the Kennedy Center. Um, it was the first Emmy that USC was awarded for uh, a documentary, multiple ones since then. But I get to say I was the first. And I graduated from college as the most highly awarded documentary filmmaker that year. That's incredible. Yes. Yeah, so how did that, how did that feel? And, and I'm assuming came with a lot of confidence to, uh, to kind of tackle your next ventures, you know, after you graduated, um, and, and kind of launch your uh, professional career. It was humbling beyond belief to walk up on the stage and to pick up an award in front of a large group of people. Um, and, uh, I remember to this day that my speech basically said, you know, 15, 20 people on my crew. And it's silly that I'm the one that's chosen to come up here and receive the award because it's really the cumulative work of, of everybody. But um, I'm, I'm happy to be the one that's standing up here to receive it. So, so a tremendous amount of humility around understanding the process and the community that it took to create quality programming. And then I graduated and the town was on strike. Actors and producers and writers were on strike. And my 42nd interview was with a pioneer in the television industry named Norman Lear. And Norman gave me a job. I walked into his office and he said, hey, man, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to sit in your chair. And he said, OK. And he got up and we conducted the interview with me in his chair and him in the guest chair. It was a tactic I still use today in interviews. Um, he chatted with me for about 10 minutes, picked up the phone, called HR and said, give the kid a job. What do we have available? A driver? Okay. He looked at me and said, you want to be a driver? And I said, love to be a driver. And that was my first job. Emmy award winning driver. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So, so what were you driving around? So he had a company back then called Embassy Communications and we had shows we were producing on the lot at Universal and the corporate office was in Century City. So my job was to work with the publicity department. And I ran a whole variety of things between the publicity office and the sound stages where, by the way, we were shooting a series called Square Pegs with this unknown but talented actress named Sarah Jessica Parker, um, who went on to some acclaim. And uh, I'm probably in dozens and dozens and dozens of vacation albums because I had a golf cart on Universal Studios and I'd always go by the tour bus and wave at the tour bus and everybody take my picture. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm nobody, but take my picture. That's awesome. Um, and um, my first my first job within the publicity department was to take all of the show biographies, actors, script synopsis, et cetera, all of which existed on paper, no digital, all of which existed in old letterhead and the office had moved. And I had to Xerox thousands of pages onto new letterhead because that's how it was done. Wow. Pretty daunting task. Yeah, it was, uh, but I made it a party. I mean, I had a, I had a Walkman, God forbid, with a cassette player and headphones and I had no collating co copier. I had to do it all the collating by myself and all the assistants would walk by and go, wow, that's just a crap job. And I'd go, yeah, it kind of sucks. And they go, but well, you're making it fun. I'm like, well, you know, what choice do I have? It's, you know, right. Um, you know, a, a good friend of mine years ago said that uh, happiness is a choice. So I chose to be happy that day. And that was how I did it. That's great. So what, what were you listening to back then? What was, what was the, uh, what would a playlist, if you, if you put together a playlist back then, a Spotify oh. playlist, what would that look like that you're you're collating and, uh, you know, 
doing all your work too. Oh, probably the same one I still have on Spotify today. It's uh, a little Almond Brothers, a uh, little uh, Eric Clapton, uh, a lot of Derek and the Dominoes, yeah, Earth Wind, Earth Wind and Fire, um, Aretha Franklin, Little Ray Charles sparkled in there. Yeah, you know Otis Redding. I'm sort of a child of the '60s, <laughs> yeah, <and> '70s. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, it's it's crazy now looking at um what's how Spotify's kind of changed everything. I mean, I, I grew up kind of, um, with, all, with all of that too, you know, cassettes, CDs, uh, then Napster and that whole, you know, being on hold for a little while, but, uh, it, it's incredible, you know, kind of how far we've come even from a technology standpoint, which, um, I know we're even, you know, working on, uh, that customer experience, which we'll touch on a little bit. Um, uh, but kind of going back to that, you know, kind of, uh, your, your, your current role now, um, how did that lead into, I know you said you worked with, uh, with Jim Henson, Stan Lee. So how did that relationship form and, um, what was most interesting about working with those folks, you know, the art of storytelling character creation. I thought that was pretty interesting what you were telling me before. Um, you'll find in life, at least I have that there are people stronger than I am, smarter than I am, certainly better looking than I am. And that you have to pick something that you can control. And what I discovered early on because of the dramatic advances I had to make both socially and academically is that I have a very strong motor. I can work a tremendous amount. I can be very efficient. I can work very hard. And that motor, which I controlled, was really the key to my success from early on when I discovered it to last night when I'm returning emails at 11.30 at night. So the hard work I put in for Norman Lear turned into a series of jobs, all that I was referred to. I honestly never looked for a job for about 14 years because the reputation that I had as the hardest working guy in the room, no one ever called me the smartest guy in the room. No one ever called me the most talented guy in the room, but everybody said I was the hardest working guy in the room. And in virtually any industry, you want one of those guys on your team. So I wound up um, working on a series called the Muppet Babies, which was created by Jim Henson and produced at that point by Marvel Studios. Marvel Studios then was much different than it is today. Um, so I would spend my time as the associate producer of the show, working on the storylines with the writers and managing the relationship with all of the stock footage that was in the show. So we would have story meetings with Jim. And, and the phenomenal thing about Jim when you talked ideas with him is that there were no bad ideas. He would never tell someone no, and he would never say that's a bad idea. He would let the conversation proceed until it reached a natural impediment. So if it was an idea that wasn't going to pan itself out, he would eventually say, well, um, you know, I don't think that that's something Kermit and Piggy would do. And you'd go, oh, well, duh, of course not. But on the other hand, he would let the story evolve and maybe – Something we talked about in season one didn't ultimately get produced until season three, but he was really a master of managing the creative process by being inclusive, but being sort of, I always refer to it as driving the bus from the backseat. He always made sure you were heading in the right direction, but you could kind of party or have fun or whatever your analogy is. So the storytelling process was paramount to Jim. And you, you develop this emotional responsibility to like, I got to bring the best idea in. You know, your competitive instincts are, obviously, I want to impress Jim freaking Henson. Right. And, and then I found myself in this really interesting scenario where he would call me and say, well, um, you know, Adam, I was thinking um, about this idea. And you're like, oh, Jim freaking Henson's calling me. So yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go figure out how to do that. And then the guy I shared an office wall with, 
he had a much bigger office than I did, would bang on the door of the wall of my office and go, hey, Adam, can you come in here? And I'd get up and go running. And it was Stan Lee. I shared an office wall with Stan for two and a half years. And Stan had a beautiful office filled with Spider-Man and Marvel paraphernalia. And he had a pinball machine, which was an original Spider-Man pinball machine. And it would break from time to time. And I would crawl under it with my screwdriver and almost tighten the connective wire because I wanted it to come disconnected. So he'd have to call me up and I'd come back in and fix it and become indispensable to him. Because while I was laying on my back, fixing his pinball machine, which I could have done in 30 seconds, but would sometimes take 15 or 18 minutes, he would talk about creating the characters for what is now the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And he would talk, it was fun, and he would talk about the key to the success of the characters that he and his team created was that they were flawed and that they were human. And to him, that was what was so important is that they had to be relatable to, you know, Clark Kent kind of was a perfect guy early on. And, and, and he really wanted Spider-Man to be someone that had conflict, that had doubt. Um, so imagine going to work and spending time with Stan Lee and spending time with Jim Henson and getting paid for the opportunity. That's yeah, incredible. The, the the amount of money that people would pay to have that experience is uh is probably you know incredible but um yeah what, what an experience to work with those two um and, and I guess it speaks to to you know what what I see people gravitating towards and I'm sure you see the same thing is um you know a lot of content out there that's very human or even Instagram accounts that are very relatable that's why people like them because they're not perfect. They're speaking to problems that, you know, actual people are having. Um, so it's relatable. So, it, it, you know, it kind of makes sense. And um, these guys were obviously ahead of their, you know, ahead of their uh, game, you know, and knew exactly what they were doing with uh, with that. Um, so that's a great, great kind of um, jumping off point. Um, what did you get into next? Um, was, was it with LA Gear? Is, is, was that the next... Um, the next venture that you had after uh, after working with those guys? Yeah, I was I was working 90, 95 hours a week for 35 weeks a year. And, and it was a tremendous amount of fun, but it was also um, taxing. And uh, I had a moment where uh, my grandfather, one of my best friends, and the parents that sort of adopted me in Atlanta after I moved out, all died in the same six month period. And I just sat down with my wife and I said, you know, there's got to be better balance in our life. I was 28 years old and uh, I had worked incredibly hard for 15 years. And um, I went to work the next day and uh, I'm sitting in an edit bay and the guy who I'd made friends with who worked in commercials um, was in the edit bay next door. And he said, hey, man, do you ever think about making commercials? And I'm like, what? That's like summer camp. You guys work hard for four days. You eat great. And then you go find another one. And he laughed and said, well, it's a little harder work than that. But I have a client that's looking for someone to help them put together a, a commercial production company. And I said, sure, I'm in. So I went down to a company and a guy walks in and says, hey, man, how you doing? I hear you're a good guy and you work hard. Direct quote. Um, Here's what I want to do. I want to build a studio. I want to build a creative shop and I want us to create and produce all of our own advertising. And I said, "Okay, um, what company is this? (laughs) And he said, he said, it's L.A. Gear. Uh, We make shoes. And I'm thinking to myself, "Okay, this is, you know. 1989. I'm, I'm in, I certainly want an adventure and something I can control my destiny a little more. So literally based on my reputation for working hard with Jim Henson and Marvel led Mike to recommend me to Sandy, who became my boss at LA gear. And we built an in-house ad agency and design firm. I managed 45 people. We produced everything from tissue paper and shoe boxes all the way through commercials that ran on the Super Bowl, we did 25, 2,800 creative projects a year. 
And uh, I went from being a kid who grew up in a trailer on the side of a highway in Big Sur to a kid who was producing commercials for the Super Bowl. That's incredible. And I'm assuming you worked with some celebrities during that that time as well, um, just given what, what LA Gear was and what that brand represented. Yeah, it, uh, you know, I, I walked into a situation where the marriage of fashion footwear and celebrities was a key marketing strategy, and they had just signed Michael Jackson before I came on board. So I was handed the relationship with Michael and the contract. And uh, I spent two years producing advertising with and for Michael. So I would absolutely say that those three people, Jim, Stan, and Michael represented in their own way the most creative people I've ever worked with. Yeah, what was it like working with with Michael Jackson? All of the current issues that have come to light with Michael, I never saw one of them, and all I can speak to is his creativity. And, And the best way I can talk about his creativity is that we had a huge soundstage at Universal with sawing and hammering and hanging of lights and all of the usual stuff that goes into a, a commercial set, a, a production set before you shoot. Music's blaring and you got lots of guys and gals with tool belts. And these are grips and gaffers and props guys that have worked with every celebrity in the known universe. And they're completely unaffected. Um, they're craftsmen and they've come to do their job. And Michael walked out of his, his trailer, out of his motorhome, and uh, we walked onto the set so he could see what it was looking like as it was being built and, you know, had a baseball hat on and a, a jacket. And uh, you could see him stand there, and it was as if a butterfly flew around the soundstage. And as it got closer to him, he began to feel and hear the rhythm. And by the time the butterfly landed – on his shoulder, he just started dancing. And I stepped back and he danced for about 90 seconds or two minutes. And it was the single most surreal sensation I've ever seen where nothing changed in the environment of the soundstage. There wasn't a noise, there wasn't a shout, there was no texting, there was no cell phones. But this energy vortex was created by Michael that drew every person in that soundstage to it. Guys that were up 30 feet above the stage, over in the corner hanging a light, felt something tap on their shoulder and turned around to watch Michael dance. His energy filled that space in a matter of seconds. And I'm telling you, hair standing up on my arm as I'm talking to you, it was as if this energy vortex at that moment took over the room, danced for two minutes, completely defined gravity, hmm. and then withdrew into a shell and went, oh, I'm sorry, and walked back into his motorhome. Wow. So what do, you, what do you think that is? Like being around him, is that something that he had special? Yes. Than, yes. than other people, even other celebrities that you met or athletes? People have the capacity to tap into something else, an alternative form of energy within themselves. Um, I've worked with Joe Montana and Wayne Gretzky and Carl Malone, and and we can talk about those guys in a minute. Um, They all would do the same thing. But Michael would tap into a place in his soul where he was incredibly insecure but was unable to control it. So there were times when I would see rhythm find him, he wouldn't find it. It would land on him in a soundstage, in a mixing studio, driving in a car, and he would emanate an energy that was not of energy that you and I have. It was, it was quite honestly the most astounding thing I've ever been a part of. But yeah, so, um, Tell me a little bit more about, uh, you know, the L.A. gear light up sneakers. How did they come to be? I know you were a part of that. Love to hear that story. Absolutely. Um, The interesting part 
in that era of the footwear industry was the reliance on celebrity or athletic endorsement to get the borrowed interest of credibility in the marketing and the sales efforts of your product. Um, so just a quick aside, because these journeys are, are always fun. Nike reached out and secured the lifetime rights in a very lucrative deal with Michael Jordan. And, and we know what happened with the Air Jordan brand. But the fascinating thing, when you think about it from a logical perspective, particularly as a basketball player, you play basketball on the ball of your foot. If you've ever played basketball, your coach would yell at you every time that your heel struck the ground. And when you went to jump, particularly in a rebounding scenario, you burst off of the ball of your foot. And when you landed, you landed on the ball of your foot. So in any of those instances, your heel never struck the floor. The only time your heel really struck the floor is when you were running from one end of the court to the other. And yet Nike and Michael Jordan, through incredibly astute advertising, branding, and Michael's athleticism, convinced the basketball world that putting air in the heel of the shoe was critical to their success as an athlete. When in yeah. fact, air in the shoe had no value at all to the performance of someone who had to jump up or come down, which is the primary function of your phil physiology of rebounding. Right. So there was an area that now was uh, prime real estate for something fun like lights. Right. So what we were trying to do at LA Gear was to find innovation that brought an audience you would not other ha otherwise have into the fold. And one thing that we knew clearly was that there was a huge opportunity in the kid marketplace. Nike had done a phenomenal job and continues to do a phenomenal job of owning performance athletics. But in the early 90s, that was just an emerging brand or section. So we, within LA Gear, we really fostered an environment of innovation and creativity. And sure enough, some folks from the development side, technical development side, came into a big meeting and said, hey, we found a way to make these lights twinkle through a proprietary switch you put in the heel of the shoe. And most of the people around the table went, well, that's kind of dumb. Who would buy any shoes with lights? In them? And very few of us around the table went, oh, my God, we could sell those until the cows came home. So vote was held around the table with the nays far outweighing the yays. And uh, president CEO Mark Goldston at the time looked down the table at a couple of uh, fabricating guys and me and said, what do you think? And being a brash young marketing guy, I said, give me $150,000 and I'll produce a commercial that'll sell more of these shoes than you can make. And uh, the production guy said, you can't do that. We'll make more shoes than you can sell. And you had a little competitive banter back and forth. But the reality is Mark looked down the table and he said, how strong are you in your conviction, Adam? And I looked him straight in the eye and said, I'll bet you my job. And he said, okay, your job's on the line. Let's go. And lo and behold, um, we produced a series of commercials that by design had to work internationally. So language was not a crutch we got to uh, rely on. These had to be purely visually based um, commercials around a campaign to promote lighted shoes for kids. And we did, and $250 million worth of shoes flew out of the door in the next 14, 16 months. So I would say it was a win-win all the way around. Yeah, that's a really incredible, even just story of, of confidence. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there listening that have ideas. It's really hard to sell that up the ladder. What would be your advice to people like that? You know, they have a big idea. They think it'll really benefit the company. Obviously, you were willing to bet your job on it. Uh, is it really just having that really strong sense of confidence that really sells it through? Or you know, everybody's so worried about which decision to make today. 
I feel like I see a lot of people struggle with that. So is it purely confidence and just communicating that, uh, you know, effectively? Um, great question. I think confidence can be dangerous because there's good confidence and there's false confidence. Um, I've had four glasses of wine and I'm confident that I can jump from the roof into the swimming pool. That's not a good confidence. Right. Um, there's the kind of confidence that says I'm going to jump ship and go help some guys um, launch an app that vaporizes pictures 20 seconds after you send them. That's a good confidence in hindsight. So I think for me and me personally, the direct answer to your question is I try to run an emotional and financial cost benefit analysis in real time. And by that, I mean, does what I know about the footwear business demonstrate to me that this gimmick or gadget would appeal to kids? Inherently, yes. I'd spent four or five years in children's programming and delved deeply into market research before that point into how kids and parents think and, and on a retail and on an entertainment basis. I had complete confidence in the ability of our team overseas to manufacture the shoes. And I knew that by putting my butt on the line, I would be given almost complete control to report to the president and CEO about the ad campaign. And he had really good taste, which meant I was confident that the campaign could be delivered and approved with a high quality of, of taste associated with it. And I had some money in the bank and I had a very small family at the time. So all of these things are going through my mind quite literally in microseconds. And again, unique skill set I was born with. It was not a unique skill set I learned. So when I felt that strongly about something, my cost benefit analysis said, yeah, I could make this work. So bang. Yeah, Mark, I bet you my job we could go get this done. Right. Now, just kind of getting into your mind, mindset for that that moment, did you think this will be a defining move in my career or was this just a really strong feeling that you had? It, like, were you kind of playing this out to see this is going to be a big part of this works? It's really going to, you know, push me to the next level or, you know, th this will be my kind of uh, leaving my stamp on LA gear. You know, what, what, where were we at at that point? I only wish that I was smart enough to politically plan my career. Who knows where I'd be today? So, no, I had not a single thought about what it was going to do to promote my career for better or worse, a key through line to a tremendous number of professional and personal decisions I've made in my life were purely based on the adventure. Mm. Heck yeah, I can solve this problem. And solving this problem became the ethos under with which I worked. And um, I honestly never gave a thought to I could get a promotion out of this because I don't think in my career I've ever taken on a project where I said to myself, if I succeed, I'll get a promotion. I've, I've always operated under the principle that hard work pays off. It makes sense. Now I know well, you had <laughs> makes sense to me. I'm sure there are right. plenty of people out there that think I'm crazy, but they won't be the first ones. It's the long line to stand in front of. So you just knew that if you put the hard work behind the ideas, you know, that you were passionate about, things would just work themselves out. I felt that if I had control, it had a much higher likelihood of success than if I were in a bureaucracy of decision making. So Absolutely. Give me control over the component pieces and give me a senior decision maker who I trusted to have good taste and make the right decision. Yeah, I take I roll the dice on that every day of the week. Yeah, I get that. Um, and, you know, in your time at L.A. Gear, I know you had some other uh, interesting stories um, it would Wayne Gretzky and, and uh, Joe Montana in particular. So I thought that was an interesting um, story that you had with them. So if you want to just touch on that quickly. 
Absolutely. When you're engaged in a marketing campaign that requires you to bring into the fold the best of the best, we had the unique opportunity to sign endorsement deals with Joe Montana as he was winning Super Bowls and Wayne Gretzky as, as he was winning Stanley Cups. And both of them incredibly nice, genuine human beings, humble um, to the core of their body. And, and one time in particular, I had the opportunity to be with the two of them directly early on in the relationship and the times with what they met each other. We were at a dinner and Joe used to talk about how certain moments of the game time would slow down and instinctually he knew where the football had to go. And separately, when you would read about Wayne or you would talk to Wayne, he would say there were certain points in the game when time would slow down and it would look like he would appear to be looking through a tunnel and that's where the puck had to go. So the opportunity came up at, a, at an introductory dinner to introduce that concept to each of them. And the next 15 or 20 minutes were one of the most interesting discussions I ever listened to because I never said another word. And it was as if two men who spoke a foreign language that only they understood found another human being on the planet that spoke the same language. And to listen to the two of them find each other in this unique way that their skill set was adapted to the sport they played. It was absolutely one of the most interesting and magical moments I've ever had. So what, what, what's your main takeaway from that? What, what, you know, at the core, what did you learn from being around them, especially at that time at that dinner? It's, it's fascinating. A, a couple of things. One is it's okay to think differently. And, and if you're confident, or if you lack confidence, but the way in which you see things is innate to your core. The way in which Joe saw the game was unique to him. He was not the fastest athlete. He was certainly not the strongest athlete. There were plenty of men that could throw the football farther and with more accuracy. But Joe had an innate sense about him and the way he thought. And that confidence that he had over his career translated to his teammates who would block for him for an extra half a second, the receivers who would finish a route or break a route and knew that the ball would be there. So what that taught me, both in listening and talking with Joe and with Wayne, was that if you believe that you have that level of confidence, even if no one else can see the way that you think, trust your instincts. That's great. Great advice. And, uh, and definitely something a lot of people can take and, and, uh, you know, combine that with, you know, your other pillar, which is hard work. So trust your instincts, trust your gut and, uh, just work hard. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard for me to put it into words, but if that part of your brain and the part of your heart says, I know, then you know and trust yourself to do it. Yeah. Now, for all the people who, you know, are, are more, they like to be a little, you know, more uh, risk averse, um, you know, it's it's a tough thing for them to do. But I think, uh, you know, it's, it's great advice to uh, – to just trust your gut and, and go all in on that. Um, so like you're saying, so let me fill that in for you for just a, a second. Yeah. If, if you feel in your heart, in your head that it's right. And at the same time in your cost benefit analysis, you don't feel that it's a risk that you alone can take. Then it's incumbent upon you to have built a team of peers along your journey in your personal professional life. So when I launched Gas Station TV with a partner, 
I had done enough and, and it was confident enough about what I knew, but there were portions I didn't know. And what I had managed to do was bring a team of people together that allowed it to succeed. So if you know that part of how your process works requires you to share the risk, then don't wake up on Tuesday with a great idea and go find your team. Start building your team now of friends and professional acquaintances that will be there when you're ready to pull the trigger. That's great advice. I've never, never really heard it put that way, but that makes sense because if you're not strong in one area and somebody else has that skill set and you can sell that vision, you know, with your confidence, that's uh, really great advice. One of the guiding principles for me in my professional life was when my grandfather told me, it's really important to know what you don't want to do. And the way that you get there is by trying things and discovering that you don't like it or you're not good at it. So I'm not a great technologist, but I knew enough to find great technologists. They became part of the team. And when I needed them, they built the infrastructure for gas station TV. Yeah, that makes sense. And Let's let's just jump right into to gas station TV for those of the the folks out there that know what it is and those who don't. Um, gas station TV, pretty amazing uh, invention. So uh, that story's pretty awesome. So uh, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about how that came to be. Absolutely. Um, I had spent four or five years in the digital signage world, although at that point in its evolution, it was an emerging industry where we were putting TV sets and video screens out of your house and closer and closer to the point of purchase. And I had consulted with billboards on Sunset Boulevard and large physical structures like Hollywood and Highland and home to the Academy Awards and on and on and on. And I had a conversation with a gentleman over lunch who ran a large chunk of media for an agency that I won't embarrass by giving the name of. And during lunch, he continually said to me that my mall network would not deliver eyeballs that he wanted because he didn't believe that women would stand in front of the TV set in a shopping mall and watch TV. And to the best of my salesman, salesman abilities, I couldn't convince him. So I asked him what would he buy? And he said he would buy a digital signage network that had a captive measurable audience. He had to know who was there how long they were there and that we could control the message. And I said, okay. And then I asked him who his, large his largest client was. And he said, large automotive manufacturer. And I said to myself, okay. So I had been hearing about guys thinking about ways to put media in a gas station. I looked at him and I said, so what happens if I can put a TV set on a gas pump? And he said, Adam, you can't do that. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not the answer. The question is, if I could do it, would you buy it? And again, he said, but you can't do it. And I said, no, 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 no. If I could, would you? And he paused and he looked across the table at me and he said, yeah, but you can't. <laughs> And that conversation became the groundwork or the, the seminal moment where I ultimately agreed to a cost per thousand basis with him. And he wrote a purchase order on a napkin. And my partner and I went out and raised um, a bunch of dough and created a category of digital signage that had never really existed on the scale and the scope that we did. And, and back then, it wasn't like you could just Google gas station manufacturer. How did you go about that? Like, where did you so, start? So there were the – so the technical challenges involved were numerous. The pump is a highly combustible environment, Division One, Division Two, and this whole scenario where – 
gas fumes or vapors, as you can imagine, are quite flammable. And if you introduce the capacity for a spark in that environment, things can go boom and people are unhappy. So we had to define a working relationship with a pump manufacturer. At that point in the United States, there were two of them, um, Dresser Wayne and Gilbarco Viterut. And we called both of them. One of, us, one of them took a meeting, the other didn't. They became our partner. Um, we became experts in how gas stations are owned and how the revenue flows from the distribution of gasoline downhill to the owner and uphill back to the oil company. And then we had to worry about the distribution of audio and video in sync from a central point. So no one's ever really thought about this, but those of us in the industry, but when you walk into a station that has gas station TV playing, there are six pumps, 12 screens, and they're all exactly in sync because if they weren't, you'd hear this god awful echo. So that kind of technology didn't exist in that application when we started this process. So we had to find technical partners and internal and external to build the entire infrastructure. And then, so you got screens that have to be visible in daylight. We won't talk into the technical complexities of that. You have to punch a hole in a gas dispenser to draw electrical power from it. We won't talk about the challenges of that. Um, then you have to program the network in a way that television advertisers can understand because back then digital signage didn't exist in the way that digital media does today. So an ad buyer had to be able to understand it as if it was a real television network. So all of the software to store and forward the content and to segment by station, by city, by state across the United States was also all part of it. So it had to act as another TV network in their right. eyes. And then, and then last but not least, the part that I used to get most excited about was when you watch a television show or you watch a story on any size screen, your phone, your iPad, your laptop, your TV at home, you're watching something that has a prescribed beginning, middle, and end. You know when it starts, you know when the middle is, and you know when it's going to end because there's a little bar across the bottom that tells you that. You can stop it, you can start it, or you can rewind it, you can fast forward it. But when you pull into a gas station, I know how long you're going to be there, but I don't know when you're going to get there. So the way you program the relationship between content commercials and commercials and content was inherently valuable because over three minutes, you'd see 80 or 90 percent of the loop that would replay itself. But since I never knew when you got there, we had to keep the content adjacencies of paramount importance. Yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought about that. In the broadcast world, television shows were designed to keep you interested between commercial breaks. Mm -hmm. It's not an exaggeration. So in, in the gas station TV world, we actually had to keep you interested enough so that the commercials were far apart enough or close enough to satisfy the advertisers so that you would watch them, but you wouldn't walk away and clean your windshield or do something else. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And even uh, even seeing recently, you know, obviously they've had, uh, you know, TVs and taxis and now with Uber, I mean, it's just another uh, another captive audience, you know, just like gas station TV. Oh, where the where digital signage has gone since I've gotten out of the industry is so far beyond the things we used to talk about as the guys. You know, there was a bunch of us that owned these networks and malls and gas stations and doctor's offices and elevators and soon to be taxi cabs and whatnot. And we fantasize about where the industry would go. And, yeah, it has exceeded so much huh. since then. So even even at that point, I mean, none of us, I, I don't know, seeing technology progress over the years, but it's really it's really opened up. Uh, so you guys didn't even think, you know, 
at that point. Um, I mean, obviously, this was such a groundbreaking technology to be able to do this. And now now all the applications of digital signage is it's everywhere. Well, and it's interesting because digital signage is prevalent. It absolutely works. And now it has it has to work in conjunction with your phone because mm-hmm. mobile phones at that point weren't as penetrated as they are now. And certainly the advent of the smartphone was just beginning. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's come a long way. Um, so a- after gas station TV, what was what was the next uh, exciting venture that you got into after that? Um, I stayed in the digital signage business, um, put together a separate group of partners and uh, went after uh, another contract in the gas station space with British Petroleum and had that moment where you feel that all the stars are aligned and that you've thought everything through. And in the final stages of that process, there was a small explosion on a platform in the Gulf of Mexico called Deepwater Horizon. And uh, within 36 hours, a year's worth of work literally evaporated. And that's not to take away from the horrible tragedy that was Deepwater Horizon, but no one ever thought about the collateral damage that we who were in the process of negotiating and ultimately going to sign a deal with British Petroleum um, went by the wayside. So, yeah, that was one of those things where no matter how smart you are and no matter how many times you wake up in a panic attack covered with sweat because you forgot about something as an entrepreneur at two o'clock in the morning, an oil derrick oil platform fire is not on that list. I can promise you that. Yeah. And, and you guys, just to fill people in, what were you working on uh, with BP at that time? Like what were you guys building up? We were working on um, the first interactive gas station network on TV. So we were working on a technology where the screens were interactive. So you could do the next evolution, which was couponing and personal content selection. Um, and have it in a hosted environment. So you pull into a gas station, you'd have a host, you could order coffee, you could print a coupon and encourage a more symbiotic relationship with advertising partners in the adjacency, as well as products sold in the convenience store. Wow. And and I'm surprised that nobody really has done that since, I I don't know if if you've seen anything, but even, you know, we have, uh, you know, gas stations out here that even even Wawa, uh, you know, is a big chain on the East Coast here. I'm surprised they don't do anything like that. Have you seen anything since then, or are there well, more hurdles to that? I mean, I guess cell phones, apps, things like that have maybe taken over, but right there's we got passed that industry got passed by with the advent of the cell phone. Now one of the largest players in the gas station C store environment is Verifone because they own the point of sale device and the pump. Um, I actually, after the BP thing um, didn't work, um, I wound up consulting for a smaller oil company that um, I won't embarrass by, or not embarrass by giving their name, but we actually built, delivered, and managed a very small network for them of interactive TV sets on a gas pump. And they worked flawlessly and delivered a phenomenal ROI for the manufacturer so we had a series of stations where you could go in and there was a host and you could play games and you could answer surveys and coupons would show up that you could take in and and buy a cup of coffee so the nice thing for me was um although it didn't succeed at a national level um we proved to my satisfaction that it would work right which is which is awesome you finally accomplished what you were setting out to do um and then after that what did you what did you move after that next um after that i stayed in the digital signage world went back primarily into consulting for large retail retail real estate developers and did a variety of very interesting projects um almost exclusively in the mall space and um Sunset Strip in in the city of West Hollywood. And in the midst of running um, 
a successful and, and comfortable life um, as a consultant, I was sitting at home at my office one day and the phone rang and a very nice lady said, um, hey, I'm uh, an executive recruiter and I'm looking for uh, a chief marketing officer, a company I represent is looking for one. And I, my first response was, and how'd you find me? And she said on LinkedIn. And I said, well, you had to dig pretty far and deep in my profile to find that. And she said, no, no, I did. Um, and uh, lo and behold, I came in and met uh, founders and the senior team of a company called Creative Circle, which at that point was and now still is the leading creative staffing firm in the United States. Had no concept of what staffing was and really fell in love with the business model and was blown away by the creativity and the expertise and the energy and the passion of, at that point, the founder and, and his co-founder, uh, Lawrence Cerf and, uh, and Dennis Maisel, and the senior team that they'd built. So I signed on and became the chief marketing officer for Creative Circle, a position I still hold today, almost six years into it which will be the longest time I've ever worked for a single employer in my career. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And you've taken, taken this company, uh, you know, growth wise, uh, to another level. I'll let you, you know, kind of, uh, do a little quick brag about that, but I mean, you've really, uh, you've really taken it and, and grown it. Um, and even what you're doing now, which I'll let you touch on, um, you know, looking for the future of what, this industry, this, you know, um, company will be, uh, it's really exciting. So I'll let you, uh, quickly touch on that. You're, uh, you're kind there. There are plenty of times where there's an eye in your career. And we, we talked earlier about feeling it in your heart and your brain and the cost benefit analysis, which is what I did when I met with Lawrence and then with Dennis. Um, but I, by no means take take credit for the success of the company. The success of Creative Circle is because of the team and the culture that was built before I got here that I've tried my darndest to uh, continue to foster and help grow. So yeah, I got here, we were $120 million in sales, more or less, privately held, and 13 offices. And we are now 30 offices, 45 cities, 400 plus employees and we're on target to do 400 plus million dollars in revenue. Um, so there's a lot in that sentence to be proud of. Um, for me, it's really this continued almost religious adherence to a culture, a creative circle that's as unique as any company I've ever worked with. It, it really is. And even for the the industry, the staffing industry that, that we're, you know, a part of, it is so different. Um, even just my background being in the agency world, uh, it is by far, you know, much different than, uh, what you would expect. So, uh, that, that culture piece really comes through strong. And I think it's, you know, because you, you, you know, the, uh, the people are, are picking the right folks to, uh, to come and work here, but yeah, it is, uh, it is a very different, um, very great culture. I, uh, I had the unique opportunity. It is a very unique culture. And uh, I was happily engaged as the chief marketing officer. And uh, we were minding our own business, walking down the street as a company. And a company called On Assignment knocked on our door and offered to buy us lock, stock, and barrel. At that point, we were employee owner owned and from a minority position and Morgan Stanley private equity had a majority ownership interest in us. And as a senior management team, as well as the owners and the founders and Morgan Stanley agreed to sell creative circle with the caveat that management stay in place to on assignment. And it was one of the most interesting processes um, I've been through. Um, we went out to Calabasas to uh, corporate offices of on assignment. Peter Damaris was the CEO at the time, and the conference room was filled with a lot of people involved in the deal. And senior management at Creative Circle sat down, and Peter came in and said, hey, I'm Peter Damaris, and 
I want you to know that barring some issue with legalities or malfeasance, every one of you has a job for two years. So just relax and take a breath. And then he went through a process of telling us how he personally nurtured and grew talent at the executive level from all of the companies that he has been a part of acquiring over his career. And that's how the conversation started. I thought it was the most interesting way to take the fear out of the room. As part of that conversation, he also looked at me and said, you're the chief marketing officer, right? I I need you um, to come talk to me because I'm smart enough to know that I need a CMO at the on assignment level and I'm dumb enough not to know exactly what you do. So a couple of days later, I drove back out there and he outlined a plan where he wanted a chief marketing officer to work with him and the parent brand and to instill best marketing practices across the family of brands that at that time um, he owned or the company owned. And I said, uh, after a bit of conversation and clarity, I said, absolutely, I'm in with one condition. And not being used to being negotiated to, he looked at me and said, and what's your condition? And I said, I wanna keep my day job. I, I really have a, a strong love for the company and the people and I don't wanna leave Creative Circle behind. And he thought about it for a nanosecond and said, okay, no problem, we can work that out. So. As of today, I have two offices, two phone numbers, two email addresses, two business cards, and two completely different structures of jobs, both of which I'm a chief marketing officer of. Yeah, and that's, that's fairly rare, right? Uh, I'm the only one I know, but I don't know that many <laughs> people. Yeah, I, that, that, that's what I thought, but um, yeah, that's... It's awesome, just you know, kind of your whole journey now in such a unique role, CMO of of two organizations, um, is quite an accomplishment. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to quickly touch on. I, I know you you talk about the twenty percent. Uh, you know, you're thinking about what people and what our customers, what our clients will be doing in two years. So, touch on that a little bit on and how uh, how you're helping us make that transition technology, et cetera? I think that it's a great question. I think we're sitting, I think, I think we're sitting at a nexus or inflection point that we're going to look back on two or three years from now and say, this was the tipping point for what will be one of the most interesting portions of the staffing industry. And by that, I mean, in its nature, the staffing industry takes phenomenally large numbers of applicants and turns them into very small numbers of placed candidates. And it's a very challenging, unrewarding journey for the applicant. And there's very little that staffing companies can do to improve that process with humanity. Meaning, is there a way that you can hire enough people to handle the applicant path so that the applicants feel like they were treated as humans along the way? The answer is no. The, the margins in the staffing business or in any business aren't strong enough to support that. So from the beginning of time until the last year or two, the candidate journey has been less than satisfactory. And we are now sitting at this nexus point where the evolution of AI in combination with machine learning that feeds chat bots and other technologies that allow for a customized journey for candidates enhanced by technology has never been done before. And we are at this tipping point where four and five years from now, it will be the standard and the norm to have a robotic, artificially intelligence driven chat bot take you from application through literally the onboarding of your process with your new job. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild how uh, how advanced it's getting and so quickly. So I'm sure a lot of people uh, anticipate, you know, exactly what you're uh, you're portraying there. It's 
it's interesting. If you if you adhere to the principle of Moore's law, which says that the speed of technology doubles every two years based on the size with which the processing technology shrinks. So everything gets faster because the processors get smaller and you can fit more of them onto your device, which really for the most part has yet to be disproven. So the technology will always expand faster than the human brain's ability to utilize it or the consumer's ability to utilize it. So in the staffing industry, no different than, than other industries, you have strong-willed entrepreneurial or bureaucratic owners who are managing a business for shareholders or owners. And their entire ethos is built around generating a profit for the owners, as it should be. And then you have this introduction of technology, which for the most part they're unfamiliar with because their age is such and their daily duties and responsibilities are such that they didn't create the technology. It's not like the guys at Google or Steve at Apple or these. These are businessmen and women running companies that technology is introduced to. So the process of agreeing to invest in the technology is so slow that the technology is advancing in leaps and bounds, which is making it better and better. So by the time large companies or mid-sized companies like ours are at a point with which they will adopt the technology, a year and a half from now, it'll be twice or three times better than it is now. So it's just it's just this beautiful point to be able to witness this process from the inside. Yeah, it really is. And even, you know, I'm sure you may have seen it in the news, but all the uh, Elon Musk with his Neuralink. I don't know if you, you caught that at all um, recently, but that that stuff's pretty it's uh, it's pretty wild if they're saying what they can make uh, happen with their neurotransmitter and, and AI and essentially tracking and, and managing our, um, you know, brain waves. You know, it's, it's kind of an off tangent, but um, essentially, did you hear about this at all? I didn't hear about it through him. I am aware of it from a variety of other sources I follow. And it's really, on one hand, it sounds like 2000 and whatever, for, for you guys, 2001, for those of us that, that lived through that, that motion picture. Um, yeah, you take that concept of neural mapping, which also is adaptive for all of the CTE issues for football players and, mm -hmm. and concussive athletes, and you marry it to virtual reality. And you'll be able to see, think, and act without moving a limb. It's insane to think that that's actually – a potential reality in the next it's, few years. It's, it's not a potential reality. They are testing it and, and utilizing it in a variety of industries right now. And so, yeah, it's, it's you know, to harken back to my 60s childhood, um, it's totally mind-blowing, dude, that, that this can happen. And it, it absolutely is continuing. And again – You've got an audience of people that are early adopters, the Ubers, you know, seven, eight years ago, I said, OK, here's what's going to happen. We're going to finish this conversation. We're going to go downstairs and we're going to ask a stranger to drive us to a restaurant where we're basing our enjoyment of the meal on reviews that other strangers gave of that restaurant. You up for it? And you would look at me and go, no way, man. We're going to Frank's around the corner because I know the bartender and we'll call a cab. Right. So the early adopter nature of today's primary consuming universe allows for the rapid acceptance of this kind of technology. That's half of the battle. People today are so much more cognizant, aware, and, and by inference, um, accepting and willing to experiment with this stuff. Right, and, and the funding's there. Right. Yes. You have a good enough idea and the right people behind it. Uh, people are ready to uh, to invest. So it makes it that much more attainable, seemingly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's interesting. And I think I think as as we've had the opportunity to chat um, 
on this podcast. Um, if there are if there are folks that are listening to it, and I'm, I hope for you, um, you get a robust audience, and I hope for those that have listened to this long, I haven't been too boring or long winded. Um, if you if you think about what it takes to listen to your instinct and this midpoint between your heart and your brain, and you run a um, instantaneous cost benefit analysis and you go, yeah, this is right. Um, then look me up on LinkedIn. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's continue this beyond, um, a podcast. Um, I'm easy to find and, uh, I don't have my name on LinkedIn and, uh, there's nothing I enjoy more than talking about great ideas or bad ideas that become great ideas. Um, so, um, I never shy away from conversation if it's an intelligent conversation that's headed in the right way, which ultimately is for the benefit of us as people and as humans on the planet. Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great place to end. You know, definitely would love to uh, to help continue this conversation and open it up to other people who uh, may have any questions or, or want to uh, to continue this and, and uh, keep it moving forward. So thank you again uh, for taking the time to, uh, sit down with me and just kind of go through and, and learn, you know, really, uh, you know, what's made you, uh, you know, a success today. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, thanks again for the time. We'll, we'll try and kick something off on the, uh, on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or, or wherever, um, I'll, uh, I'll help coordinate that. And, um, yeah, thanks again. Absolutely, Mark. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, I think where you're headed, with this series um, is interesting. I know I'll certainly be listening in and uh, I'm happy to be one of the first ones. So uh, when you're a huge success down the road, I can say, well, I remember back when I was his first interview. <laughs> I definitely will, uh, will uh, hold this uh, near and dear. So um, thanks again. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll continue the conversation. You got it, pal. Thanks so much.